Hello, welcome to our latest uh, Virtual Bridge session. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by Alistair Campbell and Kate Piper from the University of Strathclyde, who are going to give us an insight on how to make um, those statistics courses all the more exciting. So without further ado, over to Alistair and Kate. Hi, uh, okay, thank you very much. So, <coughs> um, <coughs> excuse me, my, my role in it is very limited. I'm just gonna chat for maybe five minutes to explain what I do um, and how I met Kate. Um, so I'm the learning technologist for the science faculty at Strathclyde University. Um, and I'm just gonna share my screen. Uh, I've got a wee, a few wee slides here. Okay, so um, my name's Alistair Campbell and Kate Piper is the person who's going to be talking mostly about um, Data Camp Light. Uh, so as I said, um, my role, uh, uh, my role in um, Strathclyde is as the learning technologist. Now, before that, what I did was I was the uh, the support person for my place. Uh, informally, people call me Mister <laughs> Mister My Place. Uh, so that meant that I had about three and a half years of working with Moodle. So it's fair to say that from a user interface side, not the back end, but from the user interface side, I know Moodle pretty much inside and out. Um, and that's one of the main kind of skill sets that I have. Um, now, the, the name, the sort of role of learning technologist um, has a, you know, it's, it's, quite, it's quite a varied role in terms of what people actually do. So in this role, that um, what I do is mainly based around course development, online course development. Um, so it's a bit of project management. I wouldn't call myself a project manager, but I do use some project management tools. Um, and with the skills of knowing exactly how Moodle works and what that can do for people, um, I will uh, be asked at the moment, the, the, the way that I met Kate was I was asked to um, engage with uh, academics in the statistics, mathematics and statistics department and uh, to create an MSc called uh, data analytics in health, no, da data science, oh, I'm getting this wrong, okay. uh, data science. Applied in, statistics and health sciences. Applied <laughs> statistics and health sciences, oh, my goodness. Anyway, okay, so applied statistics and health sciences. So that's how I met Kate. I also do a bit of quality assurance and, you know, I'll create what we call the My Place Build, which is the shell that they put stuff into. Um, and so I met Kate because we, I was doing a module um, and the module was, I say I, they were doing a module um, in data analytics in R. So this is a little kind of a brief kind of um, a short screenshot of like what that course looks like. It's quite standard stuff. Um, we use a, a completion progress bar. We use, you know, like um, make sure that every step is numbered and all that kind of stuff. Um, but for the most part, we use quite a standard approach um, to doing online learning, which is we or to take the lecture, break it up into smaller chunks, maybe 10, 15 minute chunks. We do the video very professionally um, with transcripts and all, all that kind of stuff. And then we try to have an activity for as much as possible. We'll have an activity for each chunk of information or each little bit of lecture that people do. And that activity usually is a, a, an assignment or a quiz or a forum, all pretty standard stuff. Um, so for the most part, that's what a lot of the courses are, are like, but I've started to try to introduce things that I'm quite um, enthusiastic about. For, for example, H5P is something that I think can you know, jazz up a course a little bit. Um, if you're not aware of that, it's HTML5 packages. You can kind of do interactive video and things like that. So th those are things that I know how to do because it's within my technical knowledge. Uh, so that's when, we Kate, that's when I met Kate. Uh, and Kate is a little bit different <clears throat> in the sense that she is not only um, extremely enthusiastic about teaching, all the lecturers are extremely enthusiastic about teaching, but is also into the technology and quite interested in online stuff and just does her own digging about. So 
she came to us when we were developing, she came to me when we were de developing that module and said, look, I've got something I think is quite cool. Um, there's a site called Data Camp and it has a code player in it. Um, and I found that you can actually find out where that, that, that um, the, 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 you can grab the code off of GitHub. I'll not talk too much about it because Kay will talk about it later. And said, can I use this in my place or Moodle? So that my job then was really about <clears throat> going to, I've got a very strong relationship with the developers uh, for my place. Um, and I went to them to talk to them a little bit about the technicalities, but mostly it's about kind of awareness of certain issues. For example, um, GDPR issues with data going between uh, Moodle and, and, and Data Camp or, or whatever. So that's basically it. That's, um, <clears throat> that's how I met Kate. And then we started down the road of using Data Camp Light in the course. And that's where I'm going to shut up and I will pass on to Kate. Oops, stop sharing. Yeah, so I haven't prepared kind of any slides or anything. I figured it would um, be a bit more beneficial to just sort of show you what it looks like um, in the context of the course and then show you some code. Hopefully people who are interested in this sort of thing will be reasonably sort of tech savvy and happy with that and won't be completely freaked out. Um, but I've got my simplest example and then a sort of harder example that I've I've kind of developed a bit more recently. Um, if you're, I will say, if you're familiar with the the sort of programming language, it's not super difficult. Like it's not, it's not a huge learning curve. Um, it's actually pretty, pretty easy. Um, so yeah, like like Alistair said, um, I was actually trying to learn how to do something else, um, and I came across Data Camp, and I just quite liked the um, the sort of structure of it. So basically, the way that they work is they give you a piece of information in terms of like a video or a piece of text and then they'll give you some programming exercise which corresponds to what you've just learned. Um, so I quite like the idea of have a piece of information, have a small chunk of information and then try and do something with that piece of information and then we'll do something else which builds on what we've just done and then you can have another exercise which then adds in that sort of building block. Um, so I tried to kind of bear that in mind while I was doing it um, and I incorporated it into lessons in Moodle um, where you have the kind of different pages and then you can ask questions and you can incorporate sort of information and stuff. So um, I think I'll just go ahead and, and share my screen. Hopefully I can share the right thing. Where is... Right, it's going to show you the Zoom thing first because that's the last tab that I had open. So bear with me. I think my Google Chrome has taken this opportunity to stop working. <laughs> of course. Why would it not? Uh, no, I'll just open right. a new a new thing. Uh, just give me a second. So um I'll just kind of fill in a wee bit here while Kate's opening that page. So <clears throat> what the what the the main thing that, that I was concerned about um the, the, it seemed to be once we got the code and we put it in literally any i don't know how familiar everybody is with moodle i'm assuming i'm assuming you you know a bit about it um so uh, we can put the code uh into any sort of description box or any kind of text box in moodle so that means like you could put it in a label straight on the course or you could put it on a page, or you could put it in a, a page in a book or something like that. <clears throat> um, so the main concern that I had was about um, what data might go, because I didn't realize, I didn't know really what was happening between Data Camp, the website, and uh, Moodle. So I was concerned that there might be any student data going between the two. Um, I don't know if you were maybe going to touch on that, Kate, but basically, the only thing that I asked Kate, or not me, the, the, the developers asked Kate to do was just to literally check with Data Camp that they're running R. So for this player, you have to rely on on their um, them to run R for you. But there's no there's no student data goes between the two. It's a it's in effect a dummy user. So what they came back and told us. So anyway, I'll stop now. Okay, so. 
first tech disaster over. Um, so hopefully you can all now see my place as it stands. So this was essentially the very first sort of data camp exercise that, that I did. And this was what I'd shown to Alistair as my example for sort of what I wanted to do with um, data camp light. So like I say, I wanted to, to have that sort of bit of information and then activity sort of side by side with it. So the first bit is just how do you fit a linear regression model in R? Um, what sort of code do you use? So the code that you use is LM. And I'm trying to, so the, the important thing for this exercise is I'm trying to encourage them to use this the argument. It's kind of better practice. Um, so you have to sort of bear things like that in mind, you know, what what things do you want to encourage and what things do you want to, to discourage? Um, because there are other ways of, of putting these variables in without specifying that data set, but it's bad practice. Um, so a bit of information about how to fit it. And then when they click on to the next page, they get this exercise. So one of the, you know, um, I want to give you a full picture. So data camp is really good. I really like it. It does have some disadvantages and I will be sort of upfront about some of those disadvantages. So the first disadvantage is um, we aren't in control of what updates data camp make and what those then do to how that interacts with middle. Um, so for example, I had this set up so that the, um, the data camp exercise appeared here and it was all really nice and all on one page. Um, and then data camp updated something just before I was about to show other people in the department what I'd done. And basically what happened is um, when you click the buttons in the data camp browser, it actually clicked the submit button, which was obviously not ideal. So the workaround then is to have a link to the exercise, which is on the, the sort of the thing, I think we might be on the wrong, I think we might not see the right same page as you, because at the moment we're seeing the page that's got the let's try it button. All oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. because my other browser decided to work and it was in front of me, so I clicked the button on that page. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so we have this sort of exercise link here, which um, is how you access the exercise. So that's because the buttons in here, when you clicked any of these buttons, it was Moodle was seeing that as clicking the submit button, which was then taking them to a page that gave them an error. An error. Um, so that was obviously reasonably unfortunate. Um, but we came up with workaround, so that's fine. Um, so for this, I'm expecting them to fit a linear regression model and then print the results. So I'll type in code, which would be um, wrong under what I want them to do. So I would do one of the, the sort of methods of getting the variables in, which I don't want to encourage. I like how you phrased it, don't want to encourage rather than discourage. Yeah, I don't want to encourage bad behaviour. Um, okay, so then, So this is this is code which is kind of almost right but not quite. Um, so they can run that and they'll get something out which looks like it might be reasonable um, just by clicking that run button at the bottom. Um, but actually this isn't the solution that I would want them to have. I would want them to specify that date argument. So when I click submit, it gives them feedback at the bottom. Um, so it says check your call of LM. Remember to use the data argument to direct the function to your data. So the hope is that that would tell the student, okay, so I need to do data equals BP and then take BP out of here. Now this function is also wrong. They should use summary instead of print, um, which is on the, the sort of previous information page. So when I submit that this time, the message changes to have you called summary. Oh no, I've not. Okay, so I want to call somebody. And then when I submit that, they get this success message. And I kind of didn't, I also didn't want to encourage people to just skip over these programming exercises. So I made the 
the page that the exercise is on a question page so that they have to do something that relates to the exercise and that can be a question about the results that come out of the, the exercise or it can be um, just do the exercise and you'll get a code and type in the code so that's what we've got here so when they get this success message they get given this code and they just copy and paste the code into the box and spit their answer and then that takes them on to this sort of next step which is how to interpret the model um, and gives them an, an example of that and then when they click on the sort of next page button it takes them to another example where I ask them to interpret the coefficients that come out of that model. So I've just taken that as a screenshot from R, put it into the, the question page um, and then asked them for an interpretation. So then I sort of look at each individual's response to that and give them some feedback there. So that's kind of what it looks like. Um, I will go back to this page and just show you what the code looks like in the middle. Uh, I'm in student view, so become yourself. Become myself. Um, so this is just on a regular sort of middle page. Um, it looks like this in normal view, so you need to switch it to HTML view, which is the two little pointy brackets. Um, so this is the kind of blurb around about it, the sort of instruction exercises, and then the rest of it is the data camp stuff. So um, the, the sort of two bits that set up the exercise are this script, which obviously calls the, the data camp server, um, and then this bit, which outlines some of the features of the actual exercise panel. Um, so these kind of stay the same data dash line equals R, so that says that I want them to do the programming in R. You can change that to PY if you want them to do Python. Um, and then these, this sort of style and height is just the, um, the way that it looks, so the, the sort of size on the page. Show run button, I want them to have the option to run their code before they submit it so that they can check for any responses, so that's what this bit is doing. And then this data dash no dash lazy dash load um, is surprisingly important. Um, so basically, if you don't include that, the module waits on you to scroll to it before it loads, which means that if you're on a page where there is no scrolling, it just doesn't load at all because um, it's waiting on that sort of scroll to it. So. Um, this is important to make sure that it works on pages which don't have a huge amount of text. Um, so that's the kind of that's the kind of setup aspect of it. And then the code that sort of sets up the exercise and does the, the tests and stuff comes in four different chunks. So the first chunk is pre-exercise code. You wrap that in this sort of code module. And this just sets up any data that you want to be in the environment that the student is using to do the exercise. Um, so I wanted to have this data set called BP. I just uploaded the data set to a location on my personal Strathclyde website and then loaded it in from there um, so that they have that data set already in the environment when they start. And then you have some sample code, so that's what you want the student to see when the exercise loads. So that was those two comments that I had with the instructions in them and the R console. So this sample dash code is what the student sees. Then you have a solution code, which is basically how you want the student to have done it, the, the sort of ideal solution. And um, so that would just be R or Python code, depending on what you're doing. And then the sort of main bit that is a bit more complicated is um, this SCT bit. So SCT stands for Submission Correctness Test. And this is where you sort of give that, that sort of feedback. Um, so you, you have various sort of commands that are stored in the test block package for R and um, I think it's PyTest for Python, but I'm not 100% sure. So um, maybe test Py. Um, so this has various functions which do um, a bunch of different checks and you can do as many or as few checks as you want. It just depends on how flexible you want to be with what you're allowing. Um, so you, it can be as simple as um, 
checking that the student code gives the same result as the solution code, you know, if, if you want to be as lenient as possible. Um, and then this sort of success underscore message bit is what gives you the, the sort of green, the text in the green bar once they've got the, the thing right. Um, and you can also provide hints, so on where you realistically think the student is, is likely to struggle. Um, so that's, that's the code. The submission correctness test looks horrible, um, and I will happily admit that the submission correctness test looks horrible. It doesn't have to look horrible, like I say, you can make it more straightforward. Um, but I'm trying to, you know, I've said this, I'm trying to encourage this sort of using that data argument, so I want to make it a bit more complicated. Um, these aren't too bad once you've used them once. Um, so I took probably a full day to do this. And then after that, I don't think I've taken more than a couple of hours to make one of these. It was just sort of figuring out how the, the different functions sort of work together. Um, so this, like I say, is, is the most straightforward one. And then I will hopefully show you um, this more complicated piece of code. Um, it's just a notepad, sorry, but uh, can you see that? Has that changed at all? Yep. So you should see a notepad file. Um, so this was for a different class. Um, there's a bit more setup that goes into it because the data set's quite small. Um, but really, I want to focus on the submission correctness test. So basically, there are two ways that are appropriate to do this bit of analysis. You can use AOV or you can use LM. And I wanted to allow both of those as options. Um, so you need to have this sort of check or, which then um, you do the solution for one of the one of the options, um, and you do the full sort of submission correctness test for that. If they've not done that, well, first, if there's anything wrong in here, it will pass them the appropriate message as long as they've used the LM function. If they haven't used the LM function, then the views, sorry, I'm highlighting the wrong bit, then the views AOV. So then that will pass and it will pass them into the bit where you check the AOV function. Um, and like I say, that is much more complicated than the last example, but that only took a couple of hours to, to sort of work out. So it does get a lot easier after the first time you've done it. I think that's kind of everything I've got to say, Alistair. I don't know if you want to. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean that's that that's basically. Um, I, I don't think there's there's much else to say about it. Um, but just uh, uh, like what from from my point of view, when uh, so the little bits that I could do to kind of help facilitate put this kind of stuff into the course, um, I think it definitely paid dividends for me personally because <laughs> because it made it, it helped my reputation in university people were like oh wow this is like really amazing stuff but also um i think the most important thing was the impact on the students because we got a fair amount of feedback from the students um talking about the kind of stuff that was on that course um and it was it was all really positive so um just, just, just in a, 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 for 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 one thing, it was just um, something a little bit different, but it just gives it a kind of slicker feel, kind of thing, you know. So uh, yeah, that's all. So if there's any questions, please direct them to Kate. Am I pointing the right way? <laughs> You're pointing the right way on my screen. So right, okay. <laughs> it's the wrong way on my screen, but I know what you mean. So um, yeah, so does does anyone in the room have questions? Um, Robert, I know I know you're com um, a computing lecturer, <laughs> so you might have a, a a question to ask here. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to ask a question. This one would actually be to, to Alistair because yeah. um, we we do run a Moodle, and um, it's a college wide Moodle system. But yeah. I had a I had a look last night. Um, um, you same with Kate. I had a look last night on the GitHub where they provide the data uh, data camp 
light stuff. Just I've never heard of it before. I've right. been looking for something which I can use to support students. And I've looked at things like is it Repl it and Code Anywhere and I even wanted to try some Jupyter notebooks, um, right. but we couldn't support Jupyter. Um, we, we seemed to have a security issue over the last year that the Jupyter notebooks wouldn't work. Right. College. But on Moodle, yeah. do, what, is there anything, I mean, we've got a standard Moodle that's used extensively throughout the college. Um, so what support need, would need to be put into Moodle to be able to put in uh, when I'm when I'm creating a page where I put in the code fragments in his HTML, is there support re required, or does Moodle just handle this? That is what I would. Uh, well, all I, as, can, all I could, all I could um, you know, legitimately say is our Moodle handles it. Um, there was no there was no extra support put in for it. Basically, the, all of the debugging. Well, I say all of the debugging. There wasn't much to be done, but Kate, the debugging that Kate did was for example we discovered that it wasn't loading if you if you didn't scroll on the page and Kate then found out that little bit of code that, that stops that. Um, and I think that's probably because it's on data camp. Normally it's hosted on data camp and data camp you have so to that, scroll yeah. through the page or whatever. So it's probably to stop it loading before it needs to. Mm. Um, and then uh, was there anything else Kate that you can remember that we had to no, I don't, oh, I don't think there was after anything. After we figured out that, that loading thing, um, as soon as you put the, the code in, it's, it just kind of worked totally fine. Yeah. Have, have you had a go at sticking the code into a page or something in Moodle, Robert? No, no, because I only, right. um, I only came across this, I mean, it was when Kenji sent the email out yesterday. I thought, oh, right. this, this sounds, but I've been looking for, for quite a while on some way I could give um, support some of the things it's interesting from what kate i mean if i go on another if i'm talking on another one i see where kate's going with i mean i don't know what level of student you're, you're working with where where you're obviously wanting them to find um what we call a best practice in terms of the way you structure the r language I, i've never used r and i would be using python obviously with this is what, what i use it for um but i can see the, the similarities there whereas my level of student i would be much more open and um, they're, they're more inclined to when they're with me if, if they're trying to uh, resolve a task i'd be quite happy for them to complete the task and complete the result and get the same result by using any form of construct so i can see where where, where kate's controlling very much trying to get um what would we call it good behaviors from them you know following a a, a good behaviour route through it and coming up with um, good practice. It's an interesting thing, actually. I would, it's something I'd like to play around with. Um, if I couldn't, the other, I couldn't the other thing that Moodle. we've put into Moodle, I don't know if that's of interest, if you're looking for different ways to kind of use code, is um, I think this year we're installing Code Runner uh, mm -hmm. into the, the quiz questions, um, but that takes a bit more set up because we have to... Yeah. They have to run a sandbox, um, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, uh, uh, sort of in the server. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm using that term like I really know what it means, but <laughs> I'm very good at using words like a, Kate's taught me loads and loads of words that I, I then go and pretend I know what I'm talking about. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, that, that's just bringing us to our 30 minutes for this uh, recorded part of the session. So I'd just like to thank um, Alistair and Kate and Robert for your contribution uh, for today's session. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again at the next Virtual Bridge session. So thanks for joining and stay safe.